Hello, and welcome to today's event hosted by the Leakey Foundation and the California Academy of Sciences. My name is Dr. Shannon Bennett. I'm Chief of Science and the Harry W. and Diana Hine Dean of Science and Research Collections and a Patterson Scholar in Microbiology at the California Academy of Sciences. Tonight, we're going to explore cooperation and intergroup relations in chimpanzees and bonobos with Leakey Foundation grantee, Dr. Liren Samuni. We'd like to thank this program's generous sponsors, the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, uh, Camilla and George Smith, the Brown Foundation, Inc., and the Joan and Errol Travis Education Fund. We'd also like to give a special shout out to those of you who donated to support our organization's programs. Now, Leakey Foundation President Jean Newman will say a few words. Thank you. I'm Jean Newman, the president of the Leakey Foundation. Today's speaker, Dr. Liran Samuni, is a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. She also oversees long-term data collection at the Thai Chimpanzee Project and the Coco Lapori Bonobo Research Project. Her research focuses on cooperation and intergroup relations with chimpanzees. This year, she was awarded the Leakey Foundation's prestigious Gordon B. Getty Grant for her extraordinary originality, dedication in her intellectual and professional pursuits, and the exemplification of a multidisciplinary approach to research. And now I'm honored to invite Dr. Samuni to begin her presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and for the opportunity to be here today. And thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, I'm really honored to be here and to be able to present to you some of my work on chimpanzees and bonobos. And in today's talk, I wish to introduce to you uh, the diverse lives of these two uh, fascinating species and what and what the studies of their behavior, their social systems can start addressing questions regarding what makes us humans. More than any other species, humans cooperate in remarkable ways, from two partners to cooperation in the thousands. We can even cooperate with people living in the other sides of the world. Our ability to share resources and knowledge with one another not only supports our long lifespans and development, 
but also allows us to conquer and thrive in diverse habitats uh, across the globe. And I think this talk that I'm giving today is just a small example of how human cooperation allows us to connect and share knowledge across space. Human behavior uh, and our societies are complex and highly variable. And together with our cooperative side, there is another side to human behavior that is much darker. Warfare and conflict are also aspects of human behavior that are uh, evident across societies. And it is thought that conflict can escalate, sorry, at times when uh, you know, our tendencies for outgroup bias, outgroup prejudice, and discrimination show up. It is nowadays serves as one of the most pressing issues that our species is, is facing. And as a, an example, by the end of 2021, over 85 million people were internationally displaced, mostly as a result of conflict between groups. We all are very well aware of the disastrous uh, results of outgroup conflict. But at the same time, conflict between groups is known to enhance the sense of group belonging, our idea of solidarity, cohesion, and cooperation within our groups. In fact, the link between the two, between outgroup hostility and conflict on one hand, and in-group cooperation and solidarity on the other, is so uh, tight that it has been theorized that the two have been co-evolved. While some argue that intergroup conflict um, has deep evolutionary origins, others perceive humans as tolerant by nature and argue that intergroup conflict is a consequence of a more recent byproduct of sedentary lives in settlements and our ability for material culture. And this question of whether warfare is an evolutionary adaptation or a recent byproduct is highly important for the understanding of our social psychology and how we function as societies today. But addressing evolutionary origins of behavior is not always uh, so straightforward. In many cases, by examining fossils or artifacts, we can start getting at the question of human adaptations. However, behavior, uh, especially in the context of intergroup conflict, rarely fossilize. An alternative approach to examining human adaptations is through the study of uh, behavior of our closest living relatives especially the primate, the great ape species illustrated on this evolutionary tree. Amongst the great apes, we share the most recent common ancestor with chimpanzees and bonobos, shown here in that node and estimated to be around 5.5 to 7 million years ago. Whereas bonobo and chimpanzees, uh, common ancestor is estimated to be between one and two million years ago. Chimpanzees and bonobos share a lot of similarities and difference in their life history and behavior that make them excellent models when we want to look at human behavior. The two species range in sub-Saharan Africa, and here you can see their biogeographical range on the map. Uh, chimpanzee have a much wider biogeographical range, shown in blue, from Tanzania in the east to Senegal in the west, whereas the geographical range of Bonobo is much more limited and restricted to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, here shown in orange pink. A natural barrier between the two species is the wide and deep Congo River. It is actually the deepest river in the world. And this river is thought to play a crucial role in the speciation of these two species and how they evolved separately from one another. They are both long-lived species and in the wild can reach well into their 50s or 60s or even more. Mothers nurse their offspring until four, five or even six years of age and offspring remain in close associations with their mother until teenage years. Their societies are characterized by, characterized by male phylopetry, meaning that males are the ones that remains in their natal groups whereas females migrate to other groups upon reaching adolescence. They live in large groups that uh, involve several males and several females, 
And group members do not always uh, spend all their time together, but during the day they split into small groups of varying sizes and composition, depending, for example, on how much food is available. And in that sense, they are really similar to us because they can really choose with whom they want to hang out and when. They're very selective about it. Within their groups, they formed differentiated social relationships with, from close connections with family members to friendships that are formed between individuals that are unrelated to one another. Between the two species, bonobos are often regarded as the more tolerant of the two. And this tolerance in bonobos is attributed to the dominant structures of the two species. While well, chimpanzees are a male dominant species with all males dominating all females, the bonobo society is characterized as a male female codominance. And it's usually females who hold the highest social status within the groups. In chimpanzees, male-male alliances are really important for achieving reproductive success and high rank, whereas in the Bonobo society, it does are the females that form strong alliances that are thought to suppress male aggression. In both species, males are slightly larger than the females, and whereas chimpanzees have those impressive canines, especially the males, the bonobo canines are, well, they're, they're less impressive. And I think one of the most uh, important difference between the two species, or the most interesting difference, is in their attitudes to outgroup members. While chimpanzees' intergroup interactions are predominantly hostile and quickly escalate to conflict, bonobos' relationships with outgroup are mainly tolerant. So, these differences that I just listed really make them valuable model species to examine the two sides of human intergroup relations from hostile to cooperative and tolerant. So let's start with chimpanzees. What do we know about chimpanzees' intergroup conflict? Across populations, chimpanzees participate in intergroup interactions during border patrols and uh, intergroup encounters. During border patrols, the very hectic and loud behavior of, of chimpanzees as they roam around in the forest changes to become very quiet and cohesive as they scout the peripheral areas of their territory. They coordinate their movements during those patrol, they stop and they listen, and they even inspect signs of the presence of chimpanzees uh, that belong to other groups. And now I would want to show you a video that depicts a little bit of the behavior that individuals show during border patrols. But I think to be able to understand how coordinated individuals are and how quiet they are, we first need to see how an everyday life uh, of chimpanzee looks like. So normally what we see is when chimpanzee travel around in the forest, they're very loud, they move in a dispersed way, Males can display and display around and other vocalize. And this is very common. Now, in comparison to a border patrol, this looks very different. Individuals are much more quiet, vigilant. They travel in much closer distance and they stop together. After listening for a few seconds or minutes, they start moving as a cohesive unit. If chimpanzees do encounter other groups, they, they, then they engage in coordinated vocalizations by pant hooting and drumming on trees. They do those displays and attacks against the out group, but at the same time that they attack uh, the other groups, they also reconvene and reassure each other by embracing each other and kissing. And this is something that is fre we frequently observe during intergroup encou encounters, this, this contrast between attacking the outsiders but embracing uh, fellow group members. Chimpanzees' intergroup conflict is associated with benefits and costs, and we know that if the group is successful, they're able to increase their territories on the expense of the neighbors, and increased territories simply gives them uh, greater access to food resources. More food also means that females' uh, reproductive success can be improved, 
And it has been shown that successful groups have improved the productive success of females. However, participating on these encounters and fights can be really highly uh, risky and costly. And beyond the energetic costs of those fights, individuals can also suffer injuries and even deaths. And uh, across all populations where chimpanzees are studied and are known to engage in conflict, we already were able to observe intergroup killings. And I think this brings me to a point that is really important for the purpose of the talk. So in order for chimpanzees to be able to act together and as a cohesive unit and to be successful during their, those encounters, they must cooperate. And by cooperating, they substantially reduce their chances of suffering costs like injury, but also increase the chances of accessing the benefits. So acting together or collectively acting together for the good, good of the group is highly important in this context. However, if we think about intergroup conflict from the perspective of the single individual, we notice a dilemma. As I mentioned, one benefit of those fights between groups is a territorial expansion. But a territory or a home range is something that is accessible to all group members equally, whether they engage and participate in those fights or not. So perhaps the best strategy for me as a single individual would be to sit aside and let others do the work. This way, I do not risk anything, but I, also, but I still have the opportunity to gain something. And this leads to a certain mismatch. From the perspective of the group, the more individual participate, the better. But from the perspective of the individual, maybe I shouldn't contribute so fast. And this is the basis of what we call the collective action problem. And here the question is, how do chimpanzees overcome the collective action problem? And how they are able to maintain cooperation during intergroup conflict? To study chimpanzees' intergroup conflict, I went to the Thai National Park in Ivory Coast, located at the west of the country, very close to the border with Liberia, here indicated in the, in the red star. The Thai Park is this gorgeous primary forest, and here you can see some footage. It takes about between one to two days to reach the site by car, depending on weather conditions. And we live in a small camp from where we, every day, just as the sun rises, leave and go to search for the chimps. We follow three groups of fully habituated chimps, and here you can see an illustration of their home ranges. And just to contextualize, their home ranges are about 35 square kilometers or 9,000 acres. They have distinct home ranges that don't overlap almost at all, except for the border areas between them. And in generally, what we know about the Thai population, that in comparison to other populations, individuals are more gregarious with the intergroups. They, are, they tend to be more cohesive. While males, uh, are the ones that tend to engage in conflicts between groups much more than females. In Thai, females still participate in those interactions. And in fact, in about 90% 90, 90 of those cases, at least one, females, uh, one female joins the patrol or the intergroup encounter. We do see some killings, but in comparison to other groups, or sorry, to other populations, those are in relatively low rates. And very importantly, we were able to examine and show that in a, a way that is very similar to humans, when there is a conflict without groups, in-group members tend to be much more cohesive and less aggressive to one another. So we see this link between an out-group threat and in-group cohesion. So to examine the question of what supports chimpanzee collective action, we wanted to ask what influences an individual decision or whether to participate in fights between groups or not. We used about 346 active intergroup encounters and it, they're active in a way that the group initiated those fights. And this allowed us to look at voluntary participation of individuals. Uh, we could really look if an individual decided to join uh, the conflict between groups or stay behind. 
We had in total 36 males and 75 females represented in our data. And some of those individuals we could observe over several decades. And overall, we could see that males are much more likely to participate in those fights as expected. And about 85% of the males that could uh, engage in those interactions did so, whereas for females, it was a bit less at about 50%. To be able to ask the question of what influences an individual decision to participate in fights, we must remember that individuals live in this very complex group where they form social relationships with individuals and the social environments really inform how they compete and how they cooperate within the groups. And in that sense, it is very likely that social relationships also inform individuals' decisions of when to join fights or not because they rely on these support systems that they have within groups. We therefore looked at both aspects of social relationships. First, we looked at strength in numbers, or the idea that if I am able to engage in those fights with more individuals from my own group around me, I am much more likely to do so, just because my, the chances of suffering at any cost are lower. So when the group is strong, I am more likely to join. However, another aspect of social relationships refers less to the quantity of relationships, but more to the quality. Perhaps I'm more likely to join these fights alongside certain individuals that are my best friends, as those individuals are usually the one that supports me during conflict, the one that wait for me as we travel around the forest, and generally offer me this connection that is more reliable and predictable. And while we looked at all those things, we also had to account for individual age, dominant strength, and reproductive status, as those are aspects of the life history, uh, the lives of individuals that can impact their decisions to fight with outgroups. So first to look at strength in numbers in uh, male chimpanzees. In these two plots, you will see um, soon the impact of uh, strength in numbers on the likelihood to participate here on the y-axis, depending on the number of females on the left or the number of other males uh, that are present. And what we can see that in both cases, whereas there is more females around or more males around, an individual is much more likely to join the fight. So strength in number is really impacts participation. But if we compare the two figures and we look at the figure on the right, we see that the impact for males is much stronger. And in fact, it takes only one other male to join for male participation to be in its maximum. So if I'm the only male, I might not join so much. But if I can act with at least one other male, I'm, I'm much more likely to join. But what about females? Here we see very similar patterns. The stronger the group, the more females are likely to join. But in the case of females, it is other females that are more influencing their behavior. So we really see some assortment by sex. Males are more influenced by what other males are doing, whereas females are more influenced by what other females are doing. Now looking at friendships, we first needed to identify who is friends with whom. And for that, we relied on grooming, which is a social behavior that is frequently observed across primates and serve as a good indicator of um, the quality of the social relationships. So we identified those friends as individuals that had a strong, mutual, and a long-lasting grooming relationship. We then could ask, if your friend is there, if uh, you're able to work together with your friend during those fights, are individuals more likely to join? In this figure, you can see the participation likelihood of males and females, males in orange and females in blue, when their friends were not there. And generally, we can see that males are much more likely to engage in those fights than females. However, when individuals are able to act together with their best friends, we see a much stronger, a much higher likelihood uh, for both sexes to participate. And for males, it's so high that if they're able to act with their best friends, 
they're almost at 100% of participation. And in that sense, we could able to show that the quality of the social relationships doesn't only influence cooperation within the group, but also informs collective action or cooperation on the group level. And this echoes resemblance to the human warfare body systems in which soldiers are often paired with one another to reinforce some sense of responsibility and togetherness um, between them. So in a system where we see extreme costs in case of a cooperation failure, like the system of chimpanzees, we see that they're able to overcome the collective action problem, that both the quantity and the quality of partners matters. And this points out to the importance of support systems for the lives of chimpanzees. We also see that there is similar mechanisms in both sexes. And this is really important because males are the ones that usually initiate those fights and engage in those fights. But if we look at what informs this behavior, we see very similar patterns in males and females. But I think now the, the next question is, is how would this such a system of collective action and cooperation would function on approximate level? Can we identify a mechanism that may support uh, this highly risky behavior. A great candidate to look at proximate mechanisms of cooperation is the neuropeptide hormone oxytocin. And you must all be familiar with this hor hormone in the context of motherhood, as it plays a really a vital role in birth and lactation. It is also a it is also having functions in pair bonding, in the protection of offspring, and even in uh, adult relationships that are non, in non-reproductive context. And in fact, some of the functions of oxytocin seem to be really relevant when we uh, think about intergroup relations. First, we know that oxytocin facilit facilitates social categorization. We also know that it upregulates neural circuits that are involved in empathy, and that it is generally associated with reduced anxiety, and thereby it has a strong link with the reinforcement of cooperative relationships. And the idea that oxytocin may play a role in intergroup conflict has been tested in humans. And what we know is that this hormone triggers what we call attend and defend psychology. So individuals or humans are much more likely to protect their in-group members and cooperate with them against an out-group threat when they are given oxytocin. But how can we measure oxytocin from wild apes? We do know that oxytocin is excreted in urines within 15 to 60 minutes after a particular event. So if chimpanzees groom, for example, here, and I'm able to collect a sample within 15 to 60 minutes after this grooming interaction, I then can analyze the urine sample and relate the hormone levels to the behavioral event to be able to ask the question of whether oxytocin is higher or lower during chimpanzee intergroup context. I collected sample uh, following different behaviors that the chimpanzees uh, show. First, to control for baseline levels, I collected the hormone uh, urinary urine samples after chimpanzees just rested or fed without interacting with anyone and without engaging in conflict between groups. I also collected samples after grooming behavior with the idea that uh, during encounters, chimpanzees often um, embrace each other and touch each other. So we also wanted to account for the impact of affectionate physical touch on oxytocin levels. And finally, I collected urine samples after chimpanzees engaged in conflict between groups. In this figure, you can see the urinary oxytocin levels on the y-axis of uh, chimpanzees during control context when they were resting or feeding. Now, if we compare it to samples collected after grooming, we don't see much of a difference. There is slightly larger variation in grooming, but we don't see a strong impact of uh, affectionate behavior. Now, comparing this to intergroup conflict, we really see a strong increase in oxytocin levels. 
suggesting that there is a reactivity of oxytocin associated with the cooperative behavior that individuals show during those intergroup encounters. So in that sense, we were able to show this increased oxytocin release, which may suggest that oxytocin can be a mechanism to support chimpanzee cooperation. And if we think about it, if oxytocin does support the cooperative behavior and allows individuals to engage together despite the risk, then an increase in oxytocin before individual initiate the intergroup in, in a conflict would be adaptive because it potentially facilitates them sticking together and acting as a unit. But how do we get at the question of anticipation, hormonal anticipation of behavior? Well, luckily for us, before uh, chimpanzees participate in those patrols and intergroup conflict, they often gather together and find the nicest fallen logs, uh, which is lucky for me, and engage in those grooming interactions that connect multiple individuals at the same time. We call it polyatic grooming. And they can sit around and groom each other for an hour, sometimes more, and only then uh, get up and start moving towards the border. And these grooming interactions, they don't only happen before uh, border patrols, but they also happen during other days of chimpanzees when there is no uh, there is no fight with anyone, no fight with an outgroup. So we could really compare the same social interaction under different contexts. And here we can see the urinary oxytocin levels collected after those large grooming sessions during everyday lives of chimpanzees. And by comparing them to samples collected exactly before chimpanzees initiated their uh, border patrol, we can really detect an anticipatory oxytocin increase. And thinking about it, how grooming is relevant for uh, engaging together in collective action, I always think of, of accounts from ancient Greece and how the, Spart the Spartan soldiers used to comb their hair before engaging in battle. So by looking at chimpanzees, we see that they have predominantly hostile intergroup interactions with males being the main participants in those interactions and main initiators. We also see that friendships are really important to support the collective action and the group level cooperation, potentially because they inform on support systems that are so important during risky situations. And we're also able to identify oxytocin as an underlying cooperation mechanism during uh, chimpanzees intergroup conflict in a way that is very similar to humans. So by now, by looking at chimpanzees, uh, one might assume that uh, if we compare to humans and the similarities between them, that in outgroup conflict and the link to cooperation is, has deep evolutionary uh, roots. However, it is important to remember that the picture is incomplete with, without also considering our other closest living relative, the bonobo. Bonobo intergroup interactions cannot be diff, cannot be any more different than chimpanzees. They are, uh, and if I need to characterize them by using one word, I would use the word tolerant. Uh, in the sites where bonobo groups frequently meet, there, those interactions are very peaceful, and we even observe prosocial behavior like grooming and food sharing. To date, despite numerous interactions between groups and years of observation, there is not a single ob uh, observation of intergroup killing, which is very different than chimpanzees. And we also know that bonobo groups are more likely to meet and get together when there's a lot of food, potentially because competition is reduced, but also when uh, there's a lot of receptive females uh, present. So females with large sexual swelling, when there's more, uh, receptive females, bonobo groups are more likely to meet and stay together. I conduct my work with bonobos in the Kokoropori Bonobo Reserve here indicated in the red star. And very similar to the Thai forest, we see a, a, we see a beautiful uh, rainforest with our camp located in the middle. And just to give you an idea of how remote this site is. To get to this site, we either need to take a boat for two weeks 
or we can charter a plane, which is quite expensive, and fly for five hours from the capital Kinshasa, followed by a six hour motorbike ride, and then about an hour and a half, two hour walk to camp. It's, it's that remote. In the site, we follow four Bonobo groups with their home ranges depicted here. And you can already see a very different picture than chimpanzees. So a much larger home range overlap between groups, about 65%. We see frequent interactions between those groups. About 30% of the time we follow them, the groups are together. And those interactions are highly variable in duration and can last from one hour or even less to 14 consecutive days. Yes, those bonobos sometimes spend two weeks together. And those uh, encounters and associations are not always peaceful, but they vary from tolerance to agonistic and then back to tolerance and maybe affectionate it really shifts during uh during those interactions and just to give you a slight idea about how those intergroup interactions look like i will show you a video and i just for those people who haven't yet heard heard bonobo vocalizations you're up you're up for a surprise so here is the moment where two bonobo groups first meet. We first hear a lot of vocalizations, some mild aggressions, especially mild compared to chimpanzees. We also see some social sexual behavior like this copulation occurring here. And then aggression picks up again. But usually after a hectic start, things calm down. The groups start traveling together and go forage on feeding trees. Here is an example of an account of uh, Bonobo is feeding on anonidium, which is a large fruit that they typically share. And here are two females that sit together in proximity and share this food between them. And it, we actually believe that one of the benefits of those intergroup interactions in bonobos is the ability to share information about the location of feeding trees. So if one group is less familiar with an area, they can get insights into where are the best trees from the other group. Once feeding ends, they take a siesta, they find those nice fallen logs in the sun, and they very quietly and peacefully groom each other. And this is something that is very frequent, and it's always uh, beautiful to see. So we wanted to get at the question of what reinforces this intergroup tolerance? How are these connections between groups are formed? And to do so, we looked at two, two years of data, about 14,000 hours of observations of two groups, and in total, uh, there was 31 adults and 95 intergroup encounters. And in general, we collected data on all ag aggressive behavior that are dyadic, that are happening between an aggressor and a victim. And about 15% of these interactions happened between individuals from different groups. We also looked at all grooming behaviors that Bonobo showed, with about 10% of grooming behavior happening between groups. And lastly, we looked at food sharing, uh, with the rates of food sharing that occur between groups being much lower at about only about 6%. So to look at the question of who are those individuals that connect groups, we first look at the aggression network. And here you can see an, a social network of bonobo uh, aggressive behavior with females represented in the red circles and males in the gray squares. And the gray connections represent the aggressive connections between groups, so between individuals that belong to different groups. And I think what becomes very clear is how central the males are. Um, the aggressive connections are much, uh, much more evident be between the males, and they're the ones that are the main aggressors between groups. Now, when we compare it to grooming, we see a very different uh, picture with females being the most important ones for, the, for forming the grooming connections between groups. They are much more central. There are a few males in the mix, and I will just tell you that those are males who have mothers uh, with them. Um, but yeah, as it seems that females are much stronger in the grooming connection, whereas males uh, in the aggressive uh, networks. Now looking at food sharing, I will show you a social network uh, illustration that is slightly different than the previous one. 
And here you will be able to differentiate between connections that are formed, food sharing connections that are formed within groups, they will be in yellow, and those that are formed between groups in blue. And again, we can see that females are the central uh, components in the food sharing networks by forming the connections between groups. And in fact, most males do not have a single food sharing connections uh, without groups. But beyond the role of females, we wanted to look if, if other characteristics may inform food sharing between groups. And specifically, like humans, each bonobo is very different in their ability to share food, but also in their willingness to share food. Some are more generous, while others don't really like to share. So what we wanted to look at is whether within group food sharing or the prosocial tendencies of individuals within their groups inform how much they are willing to donate to outgroup members. And what we see is a strong positive relationships between the prosocial tendencies of bonobos within their groups and their likelihood to donate food to our groups. And they seem to be the ones that connect uh, between groups in the food sharing network. So comparing the bonobo results to chimpanzees, well, chimpanzees intergroup interactions are predominantly hostile. We see highly variable intergroup interactions in bonobos varying from hostile and peaceful to prosocial, but it's important to remember that their hostility towards outgroup is much more muted uh, than chimpanzees. In both species, males are the male participants, but in striking contrast to chimpanzees, male bonobos uh, also groom outgroup members, which is something that we do not observe in chimpanzees. And we could also identify females as a as a in the, those individuals that play a central role in maintaining the tolerance and cooperation between groups. In general, similarities and differences between chimpanzees and bonobos can offer us insights into the evolution of our own species. They reinforce the idea that strong social relationships play a role not only within our groups, but also in our main, maintaining cooperative relationships or even, um, even uh, collective action against the outgroup. They also show us the impact of out, that impact of outside threat on collective action and cooperation is potentially evolutionary ancient, but that conflict between groups can be resolved in tolerant ways. And lastly, especially bonobos demonstrate that female leadership likely plays an important role in facilitating peacemaking and tolerance between groups. And here I would like to thank you all for listening and thank all of the uh, wonderful people that I got to work with in the last few years, and especially the bonobos and chimpanzees that are so uh, wonderful. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Samuni. Um, I have so many questions. I, I would love to hear some crazy field stories because I can only imagine how many uh, field, uh, field adventures you must have to, to underlie uh, the research that you've uh, collected, the data you've collected, which is so impressive. Um, maybe while we're, we're waiting for some, some chats to show up, do you have a favorite field story? Oh, I, I have so many. I'm not sure where to start. <laughs> but I think my favorite are when chimpanzees or bonobos actually meet other species in the forest. And it's really fascinating to see how they react to those. And I think my favorite is an anecdote of three young chimpanzees watching a tortoise and being completely fascinated by this creature. So I would say this is one of my favorites. That's great. So much like you, you, young human children. Yes. I, yeah. I think this next question actually uh, really points out the, the uh, I think, a question in, in all our minds. We can't help but think about uh, these animals as our, our closest relatives and compare uh, their cooperative behaviors to our own. And I wonder if, well, first of all, the question is, do you think the high level of cooperations in humans is based on our ability to use complex language? And that's assuming that you think that we do cooperate highly compared to our relatives. I'm not so sure. 
I think in some ways, definitely. The, the scale, you know, the number of individuals that are able to cooperate in human societies is, is really unparalleled and the ways that we are able to also work together. And I think a lot of it does rely on our complex language. Uh, with chimpanzees and bonobos, it's often difficult to get at um, how, do, how do they come to coordinate? How do they know and signal to one another their, in, their cooperative intent? There are ways, for example, those ma massive grooming sessions that they do between, sorry, before they, they initiate. I often see it as some sort of signaling of we're in this together, you know, we, we are going to work together and then they, they, they go. So I do believe that humans' ability to cooperate does rely on complex languages and also our ability to um, reward and punish when people cheat or fail to compete. Yeah, fascinating. Um, this this was something I was thinking about a lot too. It's is looking at the range of chimps and bonobos are are so very different, right? With 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 bonobos, kind of almost they almost seem less fit in the big picture of things, right? Because they're so uh, they're so restricted in range compared to chimps. So. Um, do you think that 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 restriction in range for bonobos has caused them to be more tolerant than chimps or is it is there is the one causing the other i mean maybe they have um maybe because they're more tolerant they can exist in a compressed range i mean i think this is one of the biggest question when studying chimpanzees and bonobos because we have species that are in some ways very very similar very similar social systems within groups types of relationships, types of behavior, vocalization, repertoire, very similar. And then we have one species that is very aggressive towards outsider and another that seem to embrace uh, outsider. And one of the main theories as to potentially the pressures or the consequences that led to bonobos being more tolerant is the idea that the Congo basin is potentially more lush and have more stable availability of food sources. So on one hand, more food, on the other hand, also stability in uh, the ability of individuals to access this food year round. Um, so this is definitely one of the main theories. And of course, when there is more food, there is less need to compete. Um, and we, we, we by now know that it is a, a very uh, good indicator of or uh, influencer on tolerance. Yeah, I think it's fascinating that they actually share information about where to find food with each other. That's like so opposite of competing for that resource. Um, but but here's a question. What do you think would happen if that resource became scarce or limited? Um, if there was a scarcity, do you think uh, bonobos would continue to be less, uh, less likely to have these aggressive intergroup interactions? Uh, or more so? I mean, this is a great question. What I can say is that we do see seasonal fluctuations in availability mm -hmm. of food. And during times of the years when time of the year when there is less food, they are just simply less likely to meet each other. So there are times of the year when each groups would range in completely opposite directions, almost as if they do not want to meet each other. And then they do tend to come together when there is more food. I do, however, think that the role that females play uh, in maintaining the tolerance is really important because um, maybe it didn't come across from my talk, but females, they form these very strong alliances, sometimes two females, sometimes three, four, five, sometimes it's the entire females that are present and they just come together and they um, aggress mostly males that become it when they become slightly annoying you know if you have a male starting to displaying around you would have females gathering together and chasing this male so i think also the 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 system within bonobos their dominance hierarchies allows to maintain potentially this tolerance that we see between groups that's amazing that they they're probably actually better poised to handle scarcity in a low risk way than uh, it, it sounds like uh, chimps, maybe. Um, uh, so here's another question: If if female common chimps are uh, are not if female chimps are not bonded to each other compared to bonobos to the same extent, 
um, it, it, it seems very fascinating that those graphs you showed about how uh, attuned females were to whether each uh, the other, other females participated in collective act action was so so important. It seems a little bit um, uh, dissonant with uh, against the fact that maybe female chimps are not that that bonded, and yet they are totally motivated by the presence of another female for collective action. Yeah, so this is actually, I think, a common misconception that people believe about chimpanzees. And what we need to remember is that chimpanzees are extremely diverse. Um, and different populations have, you know, different behaviors, whether it's tool use or other things, but also they have different social relationships. And while in most populations in East Africa, uh, females are often slightly less gregarious and perceived as less bonded than male chimpanzees. In the Thai forest where I work, females um, are very much integrated into the, into the group. They form strong relationships with other females. They range in the entire home range together with the males. They engage in hunts. Uh, they engage in all female patrols. So they are, they are much more central within the chimpanzee society. So I think here would be a great question is whether we will find the same pattern or not if we would look at a, at a different population, if we look at a population where females are slightly less bonded. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. I think this, uh, obviously chimps, we've had a lot of time to think about chimps and probably don't it don't don't appreciate so much the diversity of yeah of their those behaviors. Um, here's a question about a different population of chimpanzees, the savanna ch chimpanzees, and uh, they're you know they're in a different geographic region. Would they? And you mentioned that the Thai chimps are actually kind of less aggressive in the chimp spectrum than some chimp populations. So uh, where would the savanna chimpanzees fall in the spectrum of of chimp aggression, uh, intergroup aggression, as well as uh, compared to bonobos? I think first, uh, we need to remember that habitat categorization is a continuum. Mm. So we do see chimpanzees living in more savanna-like environments in both East Africa and in West Africa. But just as an example, I think that ch the chimpanzee populations that lives in the most extreme savanna habitat that is uh, studied is the Fongoli population in Senegal. And data that comes from this chimpanzee population in some way is much more similar to Thai. It's the same subspecies, the Western chimpanzees, than to the Eastern chimpanzee uh, idea of, of female sociality. Um, so in that sense, savanna chimpanzees in West Africa have females that are more bonded, that are more integrated within the groups and they are more cohesive. And I think in that sense, they really serve as a great comparative partner to the Thai chimpanzees. Unfortunately, they have such a large home range because of the scarcer environment. I think their home range is more than double the size of a Thai group. It's about a hundred square kilometer that they hardly ever interact uh, with outgroups. Wow. Um, here's a question about the oxytocin and, and, and whether it's been measured in, in humans, for example, in humans that are pre preparing to go into battle or, or after a, a, a conflict. Uh, and I'd also love to know if you intend to study oxytocin in bonobos. Yeah. Um... I think what a lot of time restricts us with human studies is actually the ability to look at naturally occurring behavior. So most hormonal studies in animals happen in, in, in the wild, whereas in humans, we usually use economic games uh, where you invite participants and they engage in uh, prisoner dilemma games or other games. So most of the oxytocin work in relation to intergroup context has been done in artificially induced situations of competition between groups. But I completely agree that to be able to look at it in uh, conf in real conflict situations will be really valuable. Perhaps the closest to soldiers in war is there are studies looking at uh, fans, for example, fans of football or soccer and uh -huh. how 
Um, oxytocin levels vary depending if the group succeeds, if the group you know, wins or loses, etc. Um, the questions about Bonobo is great. Uh, we're actually um, having first results from that. And I would just say to, to stay tuned because it is really, it, it's, it's really interesting, uh, oh. oxytocin levels in relations to Bonobo. So stay tuned about that. Okay, I can't wait. I mean, I, I think that, that the pattern you showed that a normal behavior doesn't really elevate, normal social behavior is not really changing the oxytocin levels until it's anticipatory to an intergroup conflict. And that was a fascinating pattern. And you wonder if maybe bonobos, because they're not getting into a lot of intergroup conflict, maybe the delta wouldn't, wouldn't be quite as, as great. But uh, okay, here's a question. Um, would uh, bonobos be more receptive to researchers um, being incorporated into a group uh, as a fellow group member. I, I guess it's the, it's the dilemma of scientists. How do you observe um, a group without influencing the group's behavior? And and I wonder if you know. I mean, I think the questioner is basically asking like, if bonobos are just more tolerant in general, would would researchers have less of an influence as observers or more of an influence com say compared to to chimps if we as we study chimps uh, it's a good question i think it's important to emphasize that before we are able to conduct such detailed behavioral research we usually go through a process of habituation of those animals mm -hmm. so we go to the forest or to the habitat where they live and slowly try to get them accustomed to to our presence um and it can take years. Uh, it can take five, ten years easily until the entire groups, the entire groups are like, okay, we 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 understand that you're not here to harm us, and gives us a chance to have uh, this close glimpse at their life. So it's really a long process. I I'm not sure if there is good data about differences in how long this process is between bonobos and, and chimpanzees, but I do know that between chimpanzee population, it really varies. Chimpanzee populations that experienced more pressure from hunting will mm. take much longer to habituate than chimpanzee populations that are categorized as naive, those that have not experienced any conflict uh, with humans. So it's very much depends on potentially less on how tolerant a species is to one another, but more on their exper previous experience with humans. So it sounds like by studying these two groups, both in reserves where they're presumably protected from hunting, you've at least leveled that playing field. And then it sounds like you, you do almost become a member of their group. I mean, they know you're not them, but they, they definitely lean into you as a member of their community. I mean, they allow us to just follow them around. Luckily, they don't try to interact with us, which is very important for us. So we, we maintain this distance from them. We maintain a distance to prevent disease transmission as well, which is very important. Right. Uh, we, we wear masks. Um, but, um, but yeah, so they are okay with us being there, but there is not really any interactions with us, which is the perfect, it's the perfect balance that uh, a researcher wants to achieve to be able to optimize the data collection and our ability to observe their natural behavior. Yeah. Uh, that was the last question from the audience. I have one more question that uh, as an evolutionary biologist, I, I, I was really, my interest was piqued when you said that it's really hard to find evidence of evolution, uh, uh, behavioral evolution in the fossil record. Um, and, and then you, you showed the, the difference in the fangs, uh, which to me, like the evolutionary rate of morphology that correlates to potential evolutionary differences in behavior uh, is 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 a uh, mind blowing for me. So so do you think that that the fangs are you know one great piece of morphological evidence for behavioral evolution in these two groups? I mean, there's definitely an hypothesis uh, the, called the self domestication hypothesis. There is this idea that there was some pressures on um, a reduction in, in, in aggressive reactions in the bonobos and that it has it's associated with a cascade of other um, changes, for example, um, smaller uh, sexual dimorphism, etc. So 
there are definitely ways to be able to get at uh, at, at variation behavior through fossils, through artifacts, for example, tools. Um, but I think to be able to estimate social systems and how they operate, this is something that if, if someone is able to do it with fossils or with genetics, it will be fantastic because uh, it can really confirm what we are able to see using uh, behavioral data. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you so much, Dr. Samuni. And I, for one, am going to stay tuned to hear more of the oxytocin story and more <laughs> about these amazing animals and these amazing places. You've invested so much time to understand social behaviors at a time when we humans are really thinking hard about these things too. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. And thank you to everybody. Uh, I would like to uh, remind you all that the, a recording of tonight's program will be available for replay on the California Academy of Sciences and the Leakey Foundation's websites and YouTube channels. So we hope you will watch it again and share it with your friends. And thank you everyone for coming tonight and thank you for your support. And importantly, thank you, Dr. Samuni, for all the amazing work that you've done. Thank you so much, everyone.